Good evening, everyone. Exciting night. We're starting a new, a new yeah. Sefer and Tanya, a new chapter. A new Sefer. Higaris <laughs> HaKodesh on page Kuf Beis, which is opposite of page 202. Um, as we've mentioned on several occasions, Tanya is divided into five different volumes. We've also mentioned that the first time that the Alter Rebbe published Tanya, so it only contained the first two volumes, Lakuti Amaram and Shari Yichud Vamuna. Then later on, the Alter Rebbe published the third volume of Tanya, and we published uh, the whole Sefer with um, the first three sections, Lakuti Amaram, Shari Yichud Vamuna, Nigar Satshuva. And then the Alter Rebbe passed away in 1812. The year after he passed away, in the year Tavkuf Ayin Dalid, so the sons, the three sons of the Alter Rebbe, Alter Rebbe had three sons, the oldest son was Reb Dov Ber, known as the Mittler Rebbe, and he had another two sons. They reprinted the Tanya, but they added another two sections. And they actually added also a, they added a little of Hakdama, a little of a preface. If you look on page, on page Gimel, of Tanya, which is opposite of page four, you see Haskamas Harabanam Sheikhia Bene Hagoin Hamachaberzal. This is Haskama, which is printed by the the sons of the Alter Rebbe. And this was when they published Tanya a little more than a year after the Alter Rebbe was nostalgic. And there they introduced the Sigaris Hachuva, Sigaris Hakodesh. Sigaris Hakodesh, which is the fourth section of Tanya, is comprised of 32 different letters that the Alter Rebbe wrote. And the Rebbe didn't want to publish this, so. Not that the Rebbe didn't want to, it wasn't, uh, I don't, these were widely disseminated amongst Hasidim, but to add it to Tanya, this was the idea of the children of the Alter Rebbe. And these 32 letters, these are not, um, these are not personal letters, these are, um, these are public letters which the Alter Rebbe wrote to the Hasidim, to the Kahal, the community of Hasidim, on different occasions. And in this sense, this section of Tanya is different than the other sections of Tanya. Before, actually, before we get to talking about a little more about Igaris HaKadosh, the fifth part of Tanya is called Kuntras Achren, which was also added in at that time. And ever since, Tanya has always been published as uh, these five sections, volumes put together. And Kuntras Achrin is some pulpulim that the Alter Rebbe wrote, elaborating on concepts which he discussed on the Kuti Amarim. Kuntras Achrin is very, very deep Hasidus in Kabbalah. It's a bridge we'll have to cross when we get there one day in Bezra Sachem. It's the same thing? Yeah. It's after, after Yigar Sakhir, it's called Kuntras Achrin. Oh, and also, there's some, uh, actually, some, also they added some other letters from the Alter Rebbe, also the Kuntras Achrin. But right now we're in Igar Sakhir, which again, this is, it's 32 letters. We call them. 32 simanim. When we talk about uh, the first three parts of Tanya, we talk about Perik this or Perik that, and in the Geras HaKadosh, they're known as simanim, which distinguishes this part of Tanya from the other parts of Tanya, the first three. So Lukuti Amaram is 53 chapters, 53 prakim, and these 53 prakim constitute a single whole. Their continuation, one from another, and as we discussed many times when we were learning Lukuti Amarim, it constitutes one structure, with one uh, continuation from beginning to end, with one idea, the idea of how to come to a place of Kikari Ve'elecha, Davram Yoyed, Bifiqa, Vavavcha, Laseisei, the different elements of that Pasuk, and that's something which is the entire Lukuti Amarim. And Shari Yichid is 12 Prakim, also, it's a continuation. So if you're going to start Shari Yichid with Perik Zayin, you're not really going to understand what's going on. If you're going to start Lukuti Amarim with Perik Lamed Gimel, you'll be missing the flow. And then the Geras Shuva also is 12 Prakim, but it's, a, it's an entire uh, thesis which is divided into 12 chapters. But the Geras HaKodesh, these 32 letters, each one of them is a completely independent letter. These are standalones. Each one elaborates an idea all on its own. So for, those, for some people who, who maybe when they learn Tanya, they're a little overwhelmed at how much... You have to keep in mind and the bird's eye view you need of the entire Tanya. Oh, I'm in Perik Chav Ches. 
where am I coming from? Where am I going to? I get this Peirik, but I don't see what, you know, it's hard to see the entire structure. Igaris HaKadosh, in that sense, is an easier study because if you, let's say you didn't understand Simon Gimel, well, just come back for Simon Dalet. It's fine. It's, we start from the new, every, every single letter new. starts anew with a new idea and a new concept. Well, That's one idea. These, so, the these different letters the Alter Rebbe wrote for different occasions. Such as? Um, we will see as we go along. Yeah. Oh, I see. And they address many different... Uh, they're also... We, we get a little, you could say, more of a personal look at the relationship of the Alter Rebbe with, with his Hasidim in these letters. And you have letters that are addressed for specific events. You have, uh, for example, you'll see Simon Bey's is going to be the Alter Rebbe talking about his release from prison and instructions to the Chassidim how, to, uh, how they should view this event and what their behavior should be like. This Simon, which the Simon Aleph, is instructions for the Shuls. We'll see about that. There are d- different instructions about um, the way the, Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe views Chassid Rebbe relationship. There are two letters which the Alter Rebbe writes, which are Nichum Avelum letters. We'll get to that much later on. Simon Chavzayin, Simon Chavches. One letter written as a Nichum Avelum to the Chassidim in Eretz Yisrael after the passing of Remendel Haradaker. Another letter written for Levitz of after the passing of the son. So you have a variety of different uh, ideas that are discussed in Igeris HaKodesh and different, um, different parts of the life of a Chassid that are addressed. But there is no question that the dominant theme throughout Igeris HaKodesh is the mitzvah of tzedakah. Most of the letters are about tzedakah, although not the first letter and not the second letter. The first two letters actually are not going to be about tzedakah. But starting with, but starting with uh, the third letter, most of the letters are about tzedakah. And the reason for this is, the Mazrit Magid passed away in the year 1772. Mazrit Magid was the teacher of the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya's teacher. And when he passed away, so the leadership was passed on to the most senior, I don't know if most senior in age, but definitely the most uh, the most respected one at that time of the of the um, of the Talmidim of the Magid, whose name was Remendel Haradakar, also known as Remendel of Etepsk, he wrote a sefer called Pri Haaretz. But a few years later, in the late in the late 1770s, Remendel, he, together with a few hundred Hasidim, they went up to Eretz Yisrael. And they uh, they settled in Tveria and in Sfas. And they started the the Chassidish Yishu, the Chassidish settlement, the Chassidic settlement of, of Eretz Yisrael. In fact, the Alter Rebbe originally wanted to go along because the Alter Rebbe at that time viewed Remendel of Haradak as his Rebbe. And he actually joined he joined the journey to Eretz Yisrael, but before he left Europe, he changed his mind. He was, uh, he was being begged by many, many chassidim to stay behind and to uh, be a rebbe there and to lead the flock over there. And Itake changed his mind. He went back and he became the rebbe. However, the Alter Rebbe undertook it upon himself to support the kahila of chassidim in Eretz Yisrael. And every single year, the Alter Rebbe sent substantial sums of money to Eretz Yisrael. And for that purpose, the Alter Rebbe had a Shadar. Today, I guess you'd call it a Meshulach. Shadar stands for Shlucha de Rabbana. And this Shadar would go throughout all the communities, the Chassidic communities which were in the Alter Rebbe's province, in the Alter Rebbe's provinces, in Lithuania, and in uh, White Russia. And every community was expected to contribute, every Chassidic community was expected to contribute a certain amount every single year. And every single Chassid had a certain amount that he was, uh, he was obligated to give every single year, and that money then was sent by the Alter Rebbe to Eretz Yisrael. In Eretz Yisrael, the Chassidim had nothing. The Mamash was a very, very, uh, very desperate situation for the Chassidim over there. And uh, they literally relied on this uh, financial support that came from, from Europe. In fact, uh, there's a, um, a tzedakah called Koil al Chabad, which maybe you've heard of it, maybe you've seen a tzedakah push from Koil al Chabad. Koil al Chabad is the direct descendant, I wouldn't even say descendant, it is that tzedakah which was established by the Alter Rebbe to support the Chassidim in, in Eretz Yisrael, and it has been around till this very day, and that's, uh, it's about supporting the poor in Eretz Yisrael. Now, You know, talking about having the rich uncle that supports you, right? So the Chassidish community in Eretz Yisrael, they had their rich uncle. The problem with their rich uncle is that their rich uncle wasn't very rich at all. 
that the chassidim in Europe, it's not as if that they were uh, flowing with money. And to a certain extent, trying to get money from chassidim, especially the large sums that the Alter Rebbe had pledged to, uh, to send to Eretz Yisrael, was a little like trying to squeeze water out of a rock. So every single year, the Alter Rebbe would write a letter to the chassidim encouraging them to give tzedakah. This letter was circulated amongst the chassidim, and I'm assuming also the the Meshulach who went around, oh, by the way, the Meshulach, in those times it wasn't a, uh, I don't know, today I don't know if we look at Meshulach with such uh, honor and respect. Then was, uh, the person's Meshulach was considered a person of stature, a person <coughs> who the Alter Rebbe trusted, was also, um, wasn't as if the people gave their credit card numbers, they actually gave money and you had to, uh, you had to be a trustworthy person for it. And many of these letters if not all of them, I'm not sure, but many of them definitely are in Egeris HaKodesh. So these are the letters which Alter Rebbe is encouraging Chassidim to give tzedakah. However, if you ever received a fundraising letter in the mail, and if you haven't, then I don't know which planet you live on, but... <laughs> so what does the average fundraising letter look like? Okay, there is this Almana and the Yisoyimim, and it's cold, they, they don't have heat in the winter, and they're hungry, have Rachmanis, um, it talks a lot about the needs of the people and tries to be, you try to be more Rachman, letter, you know, the average fundraiser is busy trying to get people to have, uh, to get their hearts to melt because of the desperate plight of the people for whom he's raising money. But that's not what the Alter Rebbe does in these letters. As we will see in these letters, the Alter Rebbe talks about the mitzvah of tzedakah, every letter, explores the mitzvah of tzedakah according to Chassidus and explains the tremendous value of tzedakah. And again, every single letter from, in, in a different way. And al Rebbe, he's basically talking to his Chassidim who he knew his Chassidim were, were, were lofty people. And uh, the ultimate way to encourage them is to talk about the mitzvah of tzedakah, the incredible spiritual influence of the mitzvah of tzedakah and how the, it's Karen Kayama Slo Ilam Haba but the spiritual benefits, the Alter talks about how it allows you to have it better, and it allows you to learn better, and it allows you to feel so the letters always are, are these letters are masterpieces in Hasidus, and that's why they're included here. If they were simple fundraising letters, they wouldn't make their way into Tanya. Hey, please give money, these people are hungry. They wouldn't uh, make their way into Tanya, but each one of these letters is a gem in its own right, because after you learn Yigeris HaKodesh, you really have an entirely different appreciation for the mitzvah of tzedakah. So most of the letters of the Alter Rebbe are about the mitzvah of tzedakah, but again, that's not all of them. And there are, um, out of the 32, maybe 20 of them are, maybe a little more than 20 are about tzedakah. And then there are a variety of other topics. This letter, which we are going to start with, which is Simon Aleph. And we're starting, Baruch Hashem, Shabbos, the week of Parshas Chai Yisara, Tavshin Pei Aleph. And if we can even just start the first words, Poischin bebracha. Alter Rebbe begins, we open up with a bracha, Levarech ulohidis lahashem kitoiv. To bless and to thank Hashem, for He is good. So I was looking at it this morning, and I'm like, oh, what did we have in, in Rashi, in yesterday's Rashi, in Rashi of Revi? You know, we study in Chalis and Chabad, we study every day the, the Chalik, which is Shayak to that day. So Wednesday we study Revi. So it says over there, that Eliezer, he put forth his demands that, uh, that Rivka be sent home with him. And when Lavan and Besuel acquiesced, so it says, the Pasuk says, the Vayikoid Vayishtachu, that the, that the Eved, he bowed down and thanked Hashem. And what does Rashi say? Mikan, from here, we see Shemuidim al Basura Teva, you have to thank Hashem for a Basura Teva. And I open up the, we're learning today, the first words are, Levarach Elohedis Lashem Kitoiv, because Shmua Teva Shama. I've heard some wonderful news, Vatechi Nafshi, and that has enlivened my soul. So, Mamish, the the level of the site. Well, sorry, that's what Rashi says. That you have to thank Hashem for Shmuel Teva. So, this letter is addressed to the Chassidah Shemanyana. So, for the sake of context, today we are used to the fact that, let's say, you live in Flatbush or you live in Borough Park. So which shul am I going to attend? There is the shul, which is the Ashkenaz shul, and there's the Sfarad shul, and then there is the the the, the uh, Edot Hamizrach shul, and in the, then there's a Chassidish shul, and in the Chassidish shul I have 
a, a selection of around 20 different Chassidosh Ashtiblach that I can choose from. And every single shul I go to has different menhagim and a different nusach. <coughs> and that wasn't always that way. It wasn't always that way. You hear about something called minig hamakim. What's the minig hamakim of Flapush? That's a, that's a ridiculous question. What do you mean, what's the minig hamakim of Flapush? There is no makim. There, there is a makim. Yeah. But the problem is that there are, the, no there are 50 kehillahs yeah, operating in, in, in Flatbush. In the past, minig hamakim was something which was a real yeah. thing. Every single city had its own minhagim. Minhagim means its own, its own nusach that it followed. And if you lived in Eastern Europe, that nusach was nusach Ashkenaz. Um, up until the times of the Baal definitely. And in fact, there are, you know, there are, there, there are Sfarim. Minhagi Vermeiza, Minhagi this city, Minhagi... Every city had its uh, particular nusach, its piyutim that it said, and its uh, different minhagim in different areas. And every, 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 uh, every city had its shul. And its shul was bound by the Menhagi Amakim. And if it was a big city, there were a few shuls, but all the shuls still followed the same Menhagi Amakim. With the advent of Hasidus, the Alter Rebbe encourages Hasidim to open up new minyanim in every single city where possible to open up a new minyan, a minyan of Hasidim. And obviously, the biggest difference would be the Nusach, the Tidafin Nusachari, the Nusach which the Alter Rebbe established. You know, one of the big chidushim of the Alter Rebbe is he established his own Nusach. I don't believe there's, another, there's a counterpart to that in any other Hasidus that uh, literally establishing his own Nusach, but also different Menhagim. Different monogam. The davening was different. The davening was slower. The davening was louder. Davening started later. They said uh, a Pesach by night. They said halal, and many other minhagim. That was the Alter Rebbe encouraged, and it wasn't. An, it, it wasn't in order to create machlekes chas v'shalom. It was actually to avoid machlekes. Why daven in the, in the same shul and have a matzav of latest great to do? And I'm doing you doing one thing. I'm doing another thing. Make your own. Start your own shul. And this wasn't easy, and many many communities objected to this. What do you mean, breaking away, starting your own uh, your own breakaway shul? Today, that's something which is almost standard in every city. You have it, right? Every shul, if it gets too successful, it has to have a breakaway. But back in the day, it wasn't so. That wasn't the that wasn't the the way it was. The Alter Rebbe had to defend himself against that. Even when the Alter Rebbe was arrested, that was one of the things that was brought up. The starting the different Menhagim, and different letters the Alter Rebbe writes about it. And sometimes the Alter Rebbe actually, because of the Machlech, it's caused the Alter Rebbe said not to open a minion in that particular city. We have uh, recorded letters from the Alter Rebbe that also, but in general, the Alter Rebbe encouraged that the Chassidim should have their own minion. This letter is addressed to all the minyanim of the Chassidim. This letter follows another letter which the Alter Rebbe wrote a year earlier. Now that letter is also printed in Tanya, but because we're not running here chronologically, these letters were not printed chronologically, that letter actually isn't even printed in, in Gers HaKodesh. It's actually the last letter in Kuntur Sachrin. If you turn to page 324, which is the last page of Tanya, the letter begins with the words, Hecheach, Techeach, Asam Yisacha. And that's a very, very powerful letter from the Alter Rebbe, where the Alter Rebbe, it's addressed to the Minyanim. The Alter Rebbe talks about speaking during davening, how terrible it is to speak during davening. The Alter Rebbe talks about the importance of davening mila ben mila, and speaking loud, and a um, whole letter about, how, about the decorum that has to be in the shul during davening. Then the Alter Rebbe says, if you look, on page Kuf Samach Gimel, seven lines from the top, Alter Rebbe gives an instruction. He says, "Gam also, ligmer kol hashas b'chol shana v'shana." Mm. Alter Rebbe says he wants every single minion to conclude the entire shas every year. Not not every person in the minion, but the, the minyanim. Every minion they, they should divide. Oh, divide it up. Divide it up amongst the congregants. It's called the Chalukas Hashas. Ubechol ir v'ir. And every single city, to divide the Mesaktis amongst the Chsidim, whether by Gerl or whether either by Gerl, in other words, make a Gerl who gets what Mesakta, or it should be uh, what people choose. Why is that so necessary? The Ir Shiyashba Minyanim Harba, a city that has many Minyanim, Yigmuru Bachal Minyan and Minyan, finish in every Minyan. That's what. Okay, why is it important? It's a good question. Well, when we get there, we'll get there. But that was the instruction the Alter Rebbe sent the year before. That's the letter the Alter Rebbe sent the year before. 
This year, this letter is the follow-up, so it's a year later. And now the Alter Rebbe writes. Now we're going to start inside. The Alter Rebbe writes, I'm opening up with a bracha. I want to bless and thank Hashem Ki Toiv. What am I blessing Hashem about? That Shmua Toiv Shama. I've heard a beautiful Shmua, wonderful news, wonderful tidings. Vatechi Nafshi literally has brought my soul to life. And what is that? What is this good news that I've heard? Ein Toiv Elo as the Mishnah says in Pirkei Avos. Toiv is Torah. So this news, the Shmua Toiva that I heard, is a Toiv which is connected to Torah. And not only Torah, but Torah Hashem Tamima. The completion of Torah. Meaning what? Zu Hashlamas Kol Hashas Kuloi. It is the news that I have heard that they finished the entire Shas. Bereiv Ayaris Uminyanim Anash. In most of the cities. And most of the Nyanim Anash, they finished, in other words, they listened to what I said. And in every single, in most of the minyanim, in most of the cities, they finished the entire shas. And the Rebbe is expressing his gratitude and his thanks to Hashem for this wonderful news that he heard. The Alter Rebbe says, I'm thanking you for the past. And I will request that for the future to continue in this way. By the way, I don't know if you'll, for those of you, some of you might be noting that in, the, in these letters over here, the language Dr. Rebbe is using, literally every three words is a paraphrase of a Mamer Chazal or a Pasuk. It's very poetic. The writing is, uh, you can literally make a footnote by every three, four words and say, what, where, and talk about where the source is. So Hashem should give, and Hashem should even add, to give extra strength and extra courage to those who are already strong. Every single year, with the strength of Torah. That is the, that is the opening of this letter. And just uh, to add that this is something which is, continues till this very day. Um, in Chabad, Every year on Yutes Kislev, there is a Chalukah Sashas in every single minion, and the whole Shas is divided, and this is following up on this, uh, on this idea. I, I know it's not uh, unique to Chabad, I believe in other Chassidism, they have similar practices. I don't know if in all of them, I know my grandfather was a Radamskar Chassid, and he definitely in his role, he also arranged a Chalukah Sashas every single year. So, but uh, in Chabad, it's a thing on Yutes Kislev, which is. Which is um, the Rosh Hashanah of Hasidus, the anniversary of the liberation of the, excuse me, of the Alter Rebbe, so they make a Chuluk Hashanah for the coming year. Okay. Can I ask a question with his uh, writing here? For yeah. You? He's saying here, Shmua Tova Shama V'techin Afshi. Does it have to say, Shmua Tova Shamati? I heard, V'techin Afshi. Why is it Shama? Shama Nafshi. Because for the Nefesh. Yeah. Diktuk, that's a good uh, good catch on good diktuk. But Shama is referring to the nefesh. Okay. So we should add in the gevura of Torah. What is the gevura of Torah? Well, the idea of the Adam gevura so shall Torah shebal peh vekoychav uza in order to let us know the gevura of Torah and specifically Torah shebal peh and the strength of Torah. Pira shleima hamelach alav ashalom. Shlema Melech says, Chagra be'oiz masneha. Chulum. In Kabbalah, in general, we talk about Teresh Shebeksav and Teresh Shebalpeh. And Teresh Shebeksav is associated with Chesed. And Teresh Shebalpeh is associated with Gevura. So Teresh Shebalpeh has Gevura. Gevurta shel Teresh. We talk about Teresh being oiz. It's talking specifically about Teresh Shebalpeh. And we are going to explore... In this chapter, at least in the, uh, for the first half of this, uh, of this chapter, in the first half of this letter, what is this special oiz? What is this gevura of Torah? What is the special strength of Torah, and specifically of Torah Shabbat Peh? So the Alter Rebbe draws on the words of Shleim HaMelech, where Shleim HaMelech says, Chagra be'oiz masneha. So these are words that we say in, in Eish Chayel. So Eish Chayel, on the very simplest level is uh, is praising the woman but we know that also in Kabbalah it talks about that uh, and even in the Mepharshim if you look in the Mepharshim sometimes Eishas Chayel also can be a mashal and it can be a reference to Torah is called the Eishas Chayel the Yidin are called the Eishas Chayel sometimes Shabbos is called the Eishas Chayel which is also why one of the reasons why we why we uh, sing Eishas Chayel on Friday night 
And these are all true. And it's not as if Shlaim Ramallah was talking about ten different things. He was talking about one thing. Shlaim Ramallah was talking about the feminine. The value of the feminine. Throughout the Seder Hishal Shalos, throughout all of creation, all of creation is divided into Zohar and Akeva, the masculine and the feminine. And when Shlaim Ramallah was saying Eishas Chayil, that, that applies to the Eishas Chayil on every single level. He wasn't speaking to any one specific level. He was actually talking to the core spiritual source of the feminine, and therefore that manifests itself in wherever there's feminine. So therefore, Yidin, we are feminine. We are the Eishas Chayil of Hashem. Hashem is the Chasan and we are the Kala. So Eishas Chayil is talking about us. In Oilam Hazahar Gashmi, in this world, there's men and women, and obviously the Eishas Chayil are the women. And then Shabbos and the and, and the weekdays. So weekdays are compared to the are compared to um, to the masculine. And Shabbos is the feminine. So again, Shabbos will be the Eishes Chayil. Torah and Yidden also. So Torah the Torah and Yidden also are Chasson and Kala. The Yidden are the Chasson, and the Torah is the Kala. So therefore, Torah is also the Eishes Chayil. You know, so this is just also gives you to understand that's what they say. Seven It depends where you're talking about. Relative to Hashem, we're, we're the Kala. Relative to the Torah, we're the Chassan. It's not that one day we choose to identify as a, as a woman, and another day I'm choosing to identify as a man. It's just that it depends on what, in, what, in, in, in which relationship, what our, what our role is in that relationship. In regards to our relationship with Hashem, we are the Mechabal, and Hashem is the Mashpia. When it comes to our relationship with Torah, it's the other way around. We are Mashpia, Yidin actually are Mashpia in Torah. Whatever that means. Not for, not for today, but therefore... But right now, we're going to... Sorry? And in Torah itself, Torah Shavu Ksav, Torah Shavu Ksav, correct. Now, that's why Torah Shavu Ksav is Chochma, Torah Shavu Ksav is Bina, Bina is, is the feminine, correct. So you have this, this male-female dynamic plays itself out throughout all of creation, which is why if you look in Kabbalah, everything is about male and female. Everything is about Yichudim, which means uh, uniting of the male and the female on every single level where that is. But here we're talking about Chagra Ba'iz Masneha, here we're talking about Knesset Yisrael, talking about Klal Yisrael, Klal Yisrael as a whole, we are the Eish Chayil, and Shleim HaMelech says, Chagra Be'oiz Masneha, that we gird our Masnaim, our loins, with strength. Loins are what? That's your thighs? One? What are loins? That's the million dollar question, right? Yeah, that's not a common word, too. It's common when you're learning about the uh, Masnaim and Torah, right? But you never think about it three times until finally you have to figure out exactly what it means, right? So I had to actually go look up what Masnaim, what loins are. Okay, yeah. so loins are the area, which is, if you were to put on a very wide belt, that would cover your Masnaim. Masnaim are, starts below the heart, the area of, of the ribs and the kidneys and your thighs. That is the area of the Masnaim. And... In the olden times, if you are a warrior in battle, you put on a belt, which is why uh, we say chagra, right? To, to gird yourself, they'd put they'd put a, a belt around that area, and that held you straight, and that gave you that gave you extra strength. Yeah. That uh, it was a wide belt, maybe like today they wear for hernias or something, or yeah. that was a wide belt. 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 What? It's used for weightlifting. A belt. Yeah. Weight oh, okay. Belt. So something along those lines. So that is uh, the Masnaim. So chagra ba'iz masnehal. That means. That Klal Yisrael, we gird our masnayim, our loins with strength. Now, what is strength? Torah. Torah. That we already know, right? Because yeah. Oiz is Torah, right? Gvur, gvur is al Torah. But what are, the, what are our masnayim? What is the masnayim? What is the loins of Klal Yisrael? What does that mean? So the Alter Rebbe says, masnayim. The loins, heim bechin es davar hama amit kol haguf. They hold up, they sustain, they support the entire body. Im harish, and the head, which is above them. So the body, here we're talking about the body of the upper torso, and the head, which is upon them, they all are held up by the torso. And also, the legs and the feet are attached to the masnayim. So, although the head and although the heart, which are, you might want to say, the upper parts of the body and the more, the higher parts of the body, and they are multi-talented and very capable, but they wouldn't be able to get anywhere if not for the Mosnaim, which connects them to the, the, the feet. 
Interestingly, some of you might have heard of the idea of core muscles. Never heard of, okay. There's a concept, core muscles. The core muscles that you have, which um, they really sustain everything. The area of the core muscles is more or less, most of the core muscles are found in that area, the area of the masnayim. And those are the muscles that basically keep you, um, you know, keep your head standing and keep you up and, and allow you to walk. So that midsection of the body, which is called the masnayim, <coughs> obviously we have that somehow in a spiritual sense and we need, the, we need to gird that, we need to strengthen that, add strength to that with oiz, which is Torah. Just like it is the case with the physical body. The same is true spiritually. In the nefesh, holy kiss. What is the masnaim? Emuna is the masnaim. You want to know what is the core muscle of a yid? The core muscle of a yid is the emuna. It's what sustains and holds everything together. And gets where it gets you where you need to go. Just like the example that we gave, right? It holds up the head, it holds up the heart, holds up, holds up, holds up the arm, and also it is where the feet are based on, which take you where you need to go. And all of, so the different parts of the body, physically, are all also um, spiritually represented in the nefesh alikis. The head of the nefesh alikis. That's not too hard to, <coughs> to figure out what that is. The head is the chabad, the seichel, the hisboyninos. Contemplation and Hashem's greatness. And then there is the love of Hashem, the fear of Hashem, the emotions. Those are represented by the right arm and the left, left arm. Avas Hashem is the right arm. Yiras Hashem is the left arm. Then you have the body. The body is, are the actual mitzvahs that a person does. As Dr. Rebbe discussed in Lekuti Amarim, Perik Lametes. That the body is the, is the mitzvah and that the, the arms or the wings, for those of you who remember with the discussion about the wings, right? The gadfin are the avas Hashem and yiras Hashem. And the feet, although the Rebbe doesn't talk about it over here in this Perik, but the Rebbe adds in, what are the feet? The feet is davening. That's, that's what takes you where you need to go. And that's why davening is called, you know, um, is a sulam. Davening is a, is a ladder with uh, different rungs on it. And you're climbing the ladder. Most people climb the ladders with their feet, not with their hands. So the davening is that's why davening is considered the feet. But at the very center and base of it all, supporting it all, is the masnayim, is the emuna. The emuna underlies everything. Meaning, as we are going to see right now, we know there's the chabad system. Chabad system begins with the mind. Our awarenesses, our perceptions, our understandings of, about Hashem and of Hashem. But every time you understand something, and every time you contemplate something, there are always certain established facts and realities which we take for granted. And everything that we're thinking about and figuring out are all based on those certain accepted truths. So, for example, you have someone who decides to become a doctor. He goes to medical school. He learns for 12 years. He's using his brains a lot. Everything that he's learning is based on a certain amuna, a certain belief. And what is that belief? That human life is worth saving. Absent that amuna, then nothing really is... Uh, everything that is, is, is learning is of very little value. The idea that human life is valuable and is worth saving can't be proven, it's not logical. It's an amuna, it's an underlying belief that we have. <coughs> there are always these underlying beliefs that we have which have to come before everything. They're foundational beliefs, foundational, what we call hanoches, foundational assumptions or premises that we have. The masnaim of ayid, at the very center and core of everything, and the one that actually enables everything else, enables the, enables the heart, enables the mind, enables the arms, which are the emotions, enables the feet, is a muna in Hashem. Without a muna in Hashem, there's nothing. Foundation. The foundation, right? So you can go, you can learn all the chsidis that you can learn all about Hashem, but if you don't have that amuna, what's, uh, it all begins with amuna. And chagra ba'oiz masneha, 
means that the emunah needs to be strengthened with oiz. Now, what does that mean that the emunah needs to be strengthened with oiz? That we're going to talk about Amir Sashem next week. Okay, that's going to start on next page. But first, Dr. Rebbe is going to explore a little further what this means, the idea of the emunah, and how this emunah supports everything. So again, the Masnayim are... The true Amunah and the one Hashem, the infinite Hashem. The Amunah that Hashem is, He fills all the worlds, meaning He has a relationship with everything and with every aspect of every world. And He transcends all the worlds. These are the two elements of Hashem. The, the transcendent part of the Ebishter and the part of the Ebishter that comes down and has a relationship with the world. And the Muna that the less Asar, that there is no place that is empty of Hashem. No matter how high you go, in the highest spiritual worlds, there's nothing other than Hashem. And there's no place where Hashem isn't. <laughs> No matter how low you go, even in this physical world, in the lowliest place, less asar pani mine, that place also is not chas v'shalem, empty from Hashem. V'chein l'dalat sitrin, the same thing is to all four directions, the, all, the, the four physical directions, the four spiritual directions, Hashem is everywhere. And Hashem is everywhere in an infinite way. And the same thing is when it comes to Shana and Nefesh. In other words, before he described Oilam, idea of space, Hashem is everywhere, from the highest to the lowest in every single direction, not only physically, but also spiritually, the highest to the lowest in every direction. The same is true in terms of Shana, in terms of time. Hashem always was, always will be, and always is. And the same thing is in Nefesh. All of creation is comprised of time, space. Those are the two, uh, uh, what do you want to say? Those are the two dimensions which uh, within everything is. So there is time and space, and everything which is within time and space, which is Nefesh. We are inhabitants of time and space. So in Nefesh also, time, you, you call it, maybe you call it three dimensions, time, space, and life. And in all three of these dimensions, the Ebesh there is to be found everywhere in an infinite way, and there's nothing other than him. That is the Amuno Amitis. Now, al talks about Amuno Amitis. Amuno Amitis can have two different meanings. Amuno Amitis means to believe in that which is true. You can have Amuna, and you believe in something which is false. Not only to believe in Avedah Zara, but there are certain people who also they have um, childish misconceptions about what Hashem is. From when they're four years old, they have this uh, vision of a you know, big, big, mighty, mighty person with a white beard in the sky who throws on candies if you do mitzvahs and uh, punishes you if you do averis. And some people never update their, uh, their understanding of the Eberstar. That's not a Munoh Amitis. The truth is, it never was a Munoh Amitis. Not a, that shouldn't be taught to children either. So number one is you have to get your Amunah straight. And what is, what is the Amunoh Amitis? As he says... Lasasar panimine, the munamitis is that the Ebesh is everywhere in an infinite way, always was, always will be, in oilam shana nefesh. That's a munamitis. But a munamitis also means that the muna has to be with an emes. You can believe in what is true, but it can be without your full emes. They say that there was a rav back in the day when the Apikursen, when the Haskala movement was taking off, and someone asked the rav, why is it that the Apikursen are so successful? And the rav says, because they're doing sheker with an emes, and we're doing emes with sheker. <laughs> In other words, that their beliefs are sheker, but they're doing it with their whole emes. We, our beliefs are emes, but we don't have our emes in it. We do, we do it halfway with a sheker. So amuna amitis means, number one, you have to believe in that which is true, but also amuna amitis means they have to make sure that that which, um, that, that which you believe, it's with an emes, with your whole emes, your whole metzias, your whole, your whole being. So this emuna amitis is the masnaim, it's the core muscles that is behind all of our Avedah Sashem. Hine emuna zu, this emuna, the emuna amitis, nikras, b'shem b'chines masnaim. This is the masnaim. 
This is the Masnaim of Klal Yisrael. Chag Rabbi is Masnaim. What is the Masnaim? What are the loins of Klal Yisrael? Is this Abu Amitis? Because it is Dovar Hamamidu Mekayim Asarish. It's what holds up and sustains and supports the head. What is the head? Huasechel. The head is the Sechel. Hamizboinen, the Sechel that contemplates Umamigdas and thinks deeply Bigdulas in Saif Baruch. And thinks about the greatness of Hashem, the greatness of Hashem, which is, as, as we explained, expressed in all the dimensions of Oilam Shan of Anafesh. That's number one. So the head of the Neshama, number one, thinks about the greatness of Hashem. But it's not enough to think about the greatness of Hashem, because you can think about the greatness of Hashem in a very abstract way. Also, what is the the Reish? Uberev Chastev in the Philais of Iman. Part of the Amuna, and part, not, sorry, not part of the Seichel. What is the his boyinus that a yid has to have? Is not only thinking about Hashem's greatness, but thinking about Hashem's kindness and specifically His kindness with us. Liyos Am because we are close. Hashem's Am We are the nation that's close to Him. Ula Dafka Bei Mamish. We were chosen to connect to Hashem literally. Kenoida, as is known, in my mirror it says in Chazan Pirkei Avos, Yafa Sha'achad B'Tshuva Ma'isim Tovim Be'Elam Hazam. It is better one brief moment of Tshuva and Ma'isim Tovim in this world, Mekol Chayi Elam Haba, than the whole next world. In this world we can do Tshuva. Next world there's no Tshuva. Ma'isim Tovim, Ma'isim Tovim. Ma'is is only in Olam Asiya in this world, and one 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 brief period of time of Tshuva and Ma'isim Tovim in this world is better. Mikol Chayil Mama. And the whole Chayil, what does it mean, Kol Chayil? Should say Mikhail Mama. What's Mikol Chayil Mama? We know Elam Haba is not a, is not a, uh, what do you say, a monolithic experience. Everyone has experiences at a different level of Elam Haba. What does it say that every, every, uh, every tzaddik has their own, uh, their own Hechel, their own Chupa. And everyone's experience of Elam Haba is based on their actions here in this world. But not only that. Tzadikim ain't lahem menucha alay be'elam haza v'alay be'elam haba. Tzadikim, because neshamas and gan eden are constantly ascending to higher levels. Constantly, every neshama is constantly ascending to higher level. Comes a yard site, the neshama takes a quantum leap to an unimaginably higher level, exponentially higher level. When a yid down here does mitzvahs or gives tzedakah or learns mishnayis li'ili nishmas sa neshama, that causes another aliyah ne'elam haba. Mikol Chayil Haba. We're not only talking about, you know, uh, entry level Elam Haba. Yeah, that really, entry level. You know, the, you know, when the, certainly you're, you're you're first class, not not first. You're, you're, you you come in, you're in the, low, the lower status, and then you get upgraded, right? Now, so we're not talking about the economy class Elam Haba. We're talking about Mikol Chayil Haba. Even if you're flying first class in Elam Haba. And not first class on some on JetBlue, but on Lachveis and some uh, the, some good airline. So that's why again, still one uh, 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 a, a brief period of time here in this world of tshuva ma'asim tovim is greater. Why is that? And especially, by the way, if you contrast that with what it says in Pirkei Avos, right before it, it says Yafa Shah Achas Shal Kiras Ruach Ba'Elam Haba the Kol Chay Elam Haza the one brief period of pleasure in <coughs> Elam Haba is greater than all the pleasures of this world combined. And by the way, note, there it doesn't say that even, even one brief period, brief period of economy class Elam Haba is greater than the whole Elam Haza. But on the other hand, we say one hour of Tshuva Maisim Tov in this world is greater than all Elam Haba. What does that mean? And the answer is that over there maybe we experience Hashem on a higher level, but actual connection to Hashem, actual connection, attachment to Hashem, that's over here in this world. And the Alter Rebbe, to illustrate this idea, is going to bring down some psukim, which we say in davening every day. Some of these psukim we also say when we put back the Sefer Torah and Tarn Kodesh. The Pasuk says as follows. We'll do it outside first, and then we'll do it inside. Yehalalu Hashem Hashem, Let's say 
So the Altarebbe explains this, and this is something which is explained here, but also explained in many different places in Chassidus. He explains this all on a deeper level. Yehalu Hashem Hashem. Praise the name of Hashem. Not Hashem, the name of Hashem. Why? Ki niskav shmoi levante. Because the name of Hashem is exalted all along. What is the name of Hashem? In Kabbalistic language, the name of Hashem is a reference to Malchus of Atzilus. A name is not the essence of a person. The reason why you need a name is in order to be able to relate to others, or in, order for, in order to be more specific for others to be able to relate to you. So one day if you got tired of uh, city living over here, and uh, and enough with the COVID, enough with everything, you're moving off that desert island, you won't have to wear a mask over there. <laughs> If you move off the desert island, you don't need a name. Right. Desert island, no technology, like, what do you need a name for? There's no one there. You're the only one there. If you're the only one, so why do you need a name? A name is needed to facilitate your relationship with others. So when we're talking about the name of Hashem, we're already referring to a level of the divine energy which is relating to the two worlds. Hashem himself doesn't have any names. The essence of Hashem in Chassidus is known as Atzmus Muhus. It's not a name, it's a description. Atzmus Muhus means the essence. The essence and the substance of Hashem. It's not, it's not a name because the essence of Hashem, in the words of the Zoyer, Hashem Himself is Loyis Shramis, Bishum Ois, Bishum Koitz. Hashem Himself, you can't describe Hashem with any, no word, no letter, not even a Koitz on a letter. Nevertheless, what do we say? Yehalu Hashem Hashem. You may you can praise the name of Hashem, ki niskav shmei levadi, because Hashem's name is exalted. Not only Hashem, it's obvious that Hashem is exalted. Shmei. And then the pasuk continues and says, Hoidei, Hoidei means its radiance. The radiance of what? Of Hashem's name is al eretz v'shamay. The radiance of Hashem's name spreads. <laughs> Again, in Kabbalistic language, we talk about the radiance of Malchus da Atzilus. The light from Malchus da Atzilus spreads on heaven and on earth. Heaven is Elam Haba, and earth is an Elam Haza. So note over here, Hashem's name is not present. Because Hashem's name, Nitzkav Shomei Levadeh. Hashem's name itself is beyond worlds. Hoidoi, a ray that extends from Hashem's name, I'll add it to the So you realize this is a double removal over here. Hashem himself is not even part of this conversation. In other words, Hashem is obviously completely removed from everything. Now we're only talking about the name of Hashem. And even the name of Hashem is Niskov, is completely beyond creation. And only Hoytoy, only array of Hashem is Alaris Vishamai. And what are the next words of the Pasuk? Vayarem Keren Liamai. But for his nation. Who Hashem Vayaram, He uplifted. For them, there is Keren. Keren. What does Keren mean? No, you're Israeli. Light. What else, what, is, what else does Keren mean? Four. Corner. Think finances. Oh, a fund. If you put, it could be a fund. If you put money in the bank, there's the Keren. Uh, yeah. The, the Keren principle. is the principal, right? The principal. Right? They learn in the Gemara. Keren v'choymish. There's the interest, right? There's the Keren is the principal. The thing itself. And Hoymish is, a, and then there's the appreciation. But Karen is the thing itself. A ray of Hashem is on heaven and earth. But Vayarem Karen la Amri. For Am Yisrael, we have the Karen. We have the principle of Hashem. Not only do we have the Shmoi, the name, we have Hashem Himself. What's that supposed to be? Tehillah Lachal Chasidah, Vlevene Yisrael, Am Kirevoy. Because we are Am Kirevoy, we connect to Hashem Himself. When we learn Torah, when we do a mitzvah, we're connecting to the Eibishter, not only the shame of Hashem, which is Nisqav Shmei Levadei, we're connecting to the Eibishter himself. So in Gan Eden, they're sitting and they're experiencing Yoshvin v'nehen in Meziv HaShchina. 
What are they? What, what is their hana? What is their tainu? What is their pleasure from ziv ashchina, which is the Radiant. the radiance of the shchina, which is malchus? The ziv that's the hoidai. They're experiencing the hoidai, the hoid, the ray, the light that extends from Hashem's name. That's what they're basking in, a limited, a limited extension of ma, of malchus of atzilus. And when you do a mitzvah, vayyadam keren liyame. This is the Eibishter himself. You're connecting to the Eibishter himself. At Muslim host, you're connecting to the Eibishter himself. The problem is we don't experience it. We're not, we're not in a world of experience. We're in a world of reality. Over there, whatever they have, they're experiencing. Here, the reality is this way, but we don't feel it. But that doesn't change the reality, as we said a million times, right? As the fair tracht and hubbard, because the horses are thinking about, hey, it doesn't mean the malachim are malachim. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> there was a mashpia, a famous mashpia. He, he was in Russia, and then eventually he moved to uh, Eretz Yisrael. He was a mashpia in the Yeshiva in Kfar Chabad until he passed away in uh, 1971. His name was Reb Shloy Machayim Kesselman. And when he was still in Russia, so he was arrested. And he was punished. He was sent away for a few years from his home. Not forced labor or anything. I guess one of the punishments they did was they sent you away to another city. Exile. Presumably a city where there weren't too many Yidin. And you weren't allowed to leave that city. Your, and your family wasn't allowed to come visit you. It was a, like a forced exile. It took you away from uh, your reality. Now... I don't remember if it was either after he was arrested or maybe shortly before he was arrested. His wife gave birth to twins. He had twin boys. They both eventually moved with him to Erz Yisrael. They settled in Kfar Chabad. One of them passed away. This, the, one of them passed away quite a while ago. One of them passed away like two years ago. One of, uh, the, this, the, one of the twins. But he had twins. This is probably we're talking about in the 1930s we're talking. And... He's far away, and he wasn't able to uh, see his kids. I don't know. Again, I'm not sure. Maybe, I don't know if he ever saw them. Maybe he. Maybe he was. A, maybe he was sent away before they were born. I don't. I'm, I, I'm not sure about that detail of the story. But definitely, it was a long time. And he didn't see his kids. And later, by Fabregans, years later, he would say that when the upsharnish of my kids of the boys came along, so my wife made the upsharn. I wasn't there. And my wife took some of the here and she sent it to me by mail. There were a lot of correspondence by mail. And he said that was such an incredible moment because up until that point, my wife had sent me some pictures of my kids. And obviously seeing the pictures was very special. But the pictures didn't compare to actually holding their here. The real thing. The real thing. And he says, think about that for a second. What's here? You're holding a few hairs in your hand. Here, you have a picture. The picture, you see the face, the eyes, the nose, the smile, everything. But the picture isn't real. <laughs> the picture isn't real. The here is real. That's, this, is, this is him. And he would compare that to the difference between Olam Haba and Olam Hasa. And Olam Haba, we're looking at a picture. And it's a lot of pleasure because you see, no you see the whole thing. Yeah. And you can appreciate it. But ultimately, you're only looking at a picture. And over here, you're holding on to Hashem Himself. When you do a mitzvah, you're holding on to Hashem Himself. Here you have the keren. That's more than just here. Sorry. It's more than just here, but it's still to bring out the no. But the point you're trying to bring out is that sometimes when you're experiencing something real, it doesn't have the whole texture and the whole flavor that something which is much less real will have. But it doesn't make that more real than the other. The real is real, even if it doesn't look real. There are many different examples of this, right? You can have a father and a son. Maybe the son doesn't like the father. Maybe the father doesn't like the son. But their relationship is an essential one. Then you can have a teacher and a student. And maybe the teacher loves the student. Maybe the student loves the teacher. And that's wonderful and that's beautiful. But their relationship isn't the same as a relationship between a father and a child. So again, in other words, you can have something which is less real, which is more enjoyable and more picturesque, you might want to say. But the reality remains the reality. And in reality is an Elam Hasa, not an Elam Haba. And that's why we say, Yafa Shah Achas, Shal Chuva Maisim Toifim Ba Elam Haza, Mekol Chai Elam Haba. 
In terms of this world, the idea of actually connecting to Hashem, to the essence of Hashem, that's something which we do here in this world. That's not something which is possible to do in Olam Haba. And the al explains. Again, as we know, it says, The one hour of Tshuva Maisim Tovim in this world is greater than the Olam Haba. Why? Shahu, because Olam Haba is who rak ziva are... Elam Haba is only a ray, the shine. Mebechina hanekra shechina. From that level, which is called shechina. Again, shechina, malchus of atzilu, shame. These are all synonymous, all the same idea. Shechina hashechin chulo. Shechina because it comes and it rests. It v'nivra biyud. Miyud echad mishma yizbar chulo. The pasuk says. Ki b'ko Hashem tzurei lamim, and this Chazal tell us that the ko, the yud k, the yud and the hey of Hashem's name is tzurei lamim. That is the rock of the world. That is the foundation of the world. And from this Chazal tell us that be yud nivra olam haba, and be hey nivra olam haza. Right. That's why it says elu toy l'shemayim va'aretz. Behi Baram, which Behi Baram, as Rashi points out over there, is Behi Baram, that Elam Haza was created with the He, and Elam Haba was created with the Yud. It's all Pikabala. Some of you are probably familiar with this. We've talked about it many times. Yud is Chachma, and He is Bina. So, therefore, obviously, the level of uh, revelation in Elam Haba is greater than the level of relation over there, because there's the, there Yud, and here's the He. What is the Yud? The Yud is a dot. And that symbolizes. That all of the creation of the Olam Haba is a Yud, it's like a dot. That's how little energy goes in there. Now, that minuscule amount of energy that goes into Olam Haba, which is again the Hoidai, right? That min- then it further spreads out and thins out into hay, and then above, and then a hay, right? And so our world is even higher than Elam Haba, it's even lower than Elam Haba. There's no question about that. But ultimately, to understand that in order to create Elam Haba, Hashem had to contract his air into a dot. That's how small the energy is in Elam Haba. Aval, however, Tshuva, Maisim Toivim, that's Elam Haba. But when a Yid does Tshuva, when the Yid does a mitzvah in Elam Hazagashmi, Mekarv in Yisrael Avim Shebeshemayim Mamish. That, with that, we have a connection with the Eberster Mamish, Lemuhusi Vatsmusi Kaviyachol. Then we connect to the very essence of Hashem, Bichinis Ein Soif Mamish, the infinity of Hashem. Or Kameshakos, as the Pasuk says, Hoid Yalaretz Vishamayim, right? That the Hoid, the radiance of Hashem, is to be found in this world and in the higher worlds. But Vayarem Keren, the principle, is La'amoy. That's only something uh, which he uplifted his nation to be able to experience that. Chulu, Asher Kedushan of the Mitzvah Yisav Chulu. All this is the contemplation. Where this is all the, to zoom, to focus us back. We're talking here, we started off talking about the Masnaim, the Emunah. We said the Masnaim, the loyans, they hold up the head. What is the head? The head is this contemplation that he's giving us right now. Asher Kedushanu b'mitzvah yisav v'tzivanu. How many times a day do we say the, those words? Asher Kedushanu b'mitzvah yisav v'tzivanu. What? Every mitzvah. Every mitzvah. I don't know. We start off in the morning. Al tivas yadayim, right? And then al uh, devriseira, talus, tefillin. Maybe then you wash for lunch in the middle of the day. Void, right? What does it mean? Asher Kedushanu b'mitzvah yisav. So the Rebbe explains in Tanya and Perik Mem Zayin. Sorry, Perik Mem Vav. Treb explains that Asher Kiddushanu b'mitzvah Yisav Kiddushanu means like Harei At Mekudash Asli that just like when a man marries a woman so we say V'davak b'ishtai v'hoyu l'basar echad they become one entity Asher Kiddushanu b'mitzvah Yisav means that through his mitzvahs Hashem was Mekadashas, and we become one. In the words of the Alter Rebbe, when he talks about that, he says, you know, because everything in Elam Hazah is only a, a little of a muscle. It doesn't capture. Kocha mamish v'yeser al-kein le'in 
That's how much it is, and infinitely more so, Yichud Nefesh or Likis, the Yichud of the Neshama, with the Eir Saf when he's learning Torah or doing mitzvahs. So, Asher Kedeshana B'mitzvah, we're doing a mitzvah, we're becoming one with Hashem. And then the Atrebbe continues over there in Perek Mambo, and says, another Peshat in Asher Kedeshana, which is related. Asher Kedeshana B'mitzvah, Helonu L'maylus Kodesh Elyon. Which really follows, if we become one with Hashem, then we become as holy as Hashem. Those words are uh, <laughs> difficult words to say, but you know, it says, the Pasuk says, Kedoshim to you, and, you, and uh, Rashi brings from Chazal, it says, Yochel Kamoini, right? You would think that you can be as holy as me. And famously, Reb Nachem Chernobler says, Yochel Kamoini Benichusa. It's not a question, it's a statement. Kedoshim to you, and Hashem says, Yochel Kameini, you can be as holy as me. When you do a mitzvah, Halanu Lamailas Kedosh Ha'elyon, the Abish there lifts us up because we become Lebasar Echad. We become as holy as Him. Not holy, Memala Kalaman, holy on the level of Seva Kalaman, as Dr. Rebbe explains in Perek Memvah. This is all part of what we're thinking. When we're talking about, in the words of the Alter Rebbe, Bereiv Chastev and Nefila Yisrav Imanu Liyais Amkerevay. The chesed that the Ebeshter does with us, that we can be amkir reve, that we can do mitzvahs. And think, you think about that for a moment. You wake up in the morning and you're rubbing your eyes and you're busy being upset that you have to wake up so early. And you turn over and you watch your nagel vasar. And then you mumble asher to the son of the mitzvah. Stop for a second and think those words that you just said asher to the son of the mitzvah. What did you just say? You just said that you took a cup of water and you poured it six times on your hand. And by doing that, you did something which is greater than kol elam haba, kol chay elam haba. Kol chay elam haba. And all the tainug that they have from the zif hashchina is nothing compared to that negel vaser that you just washed. V'har raya, what's the proof? What is the bracha you just made? Asher Kiddushanu B'mitzvah Yudas made a bracha and said B'mitzvah by doing this mitzvah by washing Nagel Vasar I was just V'hoyu L'basar Echad I became one with the Ebeshter and I became elevated to the Maila of Kodesh HaElyon V'yarem Karen Liyame This is the Rish This is the Isboinenos that a person thinks And we'll, I guess we'll conclude in Mir Hashem next week. Um, um, the the, the Hizbaynanos, and again, the whole point we're trying to bring out is that this whole Hizbaynanos is supported by the Masnaim, which is the Emunah. And we'll to be, to be continued in Mir Hashem next week. So, I guess, good job, everyone. Thank you.